Good morning, Bethel Church. Well, that's the last time I want to have the joy of saying that to you, but uh, as you know, this is uh, my swan song, so to speak, and so it's good to be with you on, on this Sunday, my last Sunday here. I know that you are eager to meet and greet and get to know your new pastor, Brad, Brad Gray, and his family. He will be here next Sunday to preach, and so I know you'll want to be here to meet him if you're able and you feel safe to do so. But again, we want uh, all of you to come as you feel comfortable, and if you don't feel comfortable with the safe distancing and coming to worship in person, then, then by all means stay home because we'll be uh, providing these services online. So we greet you this morning in the name of Jesus Christ. We also greet those who are worshiping with us online. I've been asked to announce uh, the flowers, about the flowers on the altar. They have been given to the glory of God by the New Life Sunday School class in honor of all U.S. veterans as we celebrate Independence Day this Saturday. Now, another announcement about how we are to be dismissed as we did uh, Similar to last week, we're going to let the ushers dismiss us at the end of the service. However, we're going to make a slight change to how that happens. So those of you who are sitting on my right and your left, we're going to ask that you exit this door here and that those who are sitting to my left over here um, will exit through the back of the sanctuary because of all the musical instruments we have here, which makes it a little bit of a bottleneck and makes it difficult to get through. So this side through this door, this side through this door. Very good. All right. And as last week, uh, let's stand and turn and greet one another with a holy wave of the hand and a smile and a blessing to all. <laughs> Amen. with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit,
not to us, but to your name be the glory. Not to us, but to your name be the glory. Not to us, but to your name be the glory. For me, it's all for you. Let the heavens shake and split the sky. Let the people clap their hands and cry. It's not for us, it's all for you. So this morning, we, we want to pray. We always pray in worship, and we seek God in the midst of worship. And for prayer concerns this morning, we have a few folks we want to continue to remember. We want to continue to remember Ignacio Rivera, and we want to uh, remember Wally and Nancy Robertson and Joe and Debbie Locke. We want to remember our youth, uh, 
Y'all going on the beach trip this, this week. So our youth will be heading down to Garden City Chapel. And uh, hopefully the weather will be nice and be fun, you know. They're going to head down to the beach. And then, uh, you know, Ben, we want to remember you and Laura. We want to remember you and your new phase, the new journey that you are embarking. And we certainly do want to pray for our new pastor, um, Brad. So I invite us all to uh, let us bow in worship and prayer. Almighty and gracious God, we acknowledge that we are living in strange times. And God, I think many of us probably feel like we are maybe wandering in the wilderness like your children, the Israelites, did so many years ago when they left the security of Egypt and found themselves in the desert for 40 years. And they wandered. And there were times when they were frightened and fearful. There were times when they were anxious, uncertain, even about the basics, where they would find water, where they would find food, where they would find shelter. They had no idea how long they would be wandering in the wilderness. They had no idea how long it would take them to reach the promised land. But God, we also remember that you were with your children in the wilderness. You were a pillar at night, cloud by day. That you were with your people, that you were leading them, that you were guiding them, that you were directing their steps, that you were protecting them, and you were providing for them. And God, through that long wilderness journey, your children learned to trust you and to know you as a loving and kind God. Oh Lord, I pray that you will continue to instill that kind of faith in each and every one of us as we meet the challenges that exist among us. Oh God, we continue to pray uh, for all of us as we continue to be impacted by COVID-19 on so many different levels and in so many different ways. Oh God, we pray for our nation During a time of great division and unrest, a time that is tense, but God, you are our God and this is your world. You created this world, you created each and every one of us. You love us enough that you are willing to send your son into this world to die for this world and we continue to trust you and to trust your grace, to trust your love. Oh God, we pray, especially for those whose names have been spoken. We ask that you touch them, bring them healing, bring them relief, bring them encouragement. Oh God, we continue to pray for medical personnel who are on the front lines. We pray for them, we pray for their families. Oh God, we pray for Ben and Laura that you will bless them as they begin a new phase of life as the journey continues. Bless them in this time of transition. Bless their new congregation. May they all feel your presence. Know you as the good shepherd. Oh God, we pray for Brad and Megan and their children as they transition to Bethel. As our new pastor and parsonage family, we pray that you will bless them also in their time of transition. A time of new beginnings, but also a time of sorrow as they say goodbye to their congregations that they have served for so long. God, I pray that you will guide and direct each of us. Help us to be makers of peace at home, at work, at play, here at the church. God, help us to create and make space for peace. And I pray that your Holy Spirit will guide and direct and help us with that. Oh God, we are thankful for all of our many blessings, and we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.
into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thy is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Just having known you for a few days and having heard you sing a couple of times, I, and uh, I know that congregation has experienced your gifts already. I think they're going to want to keep you right on past the summer and into the semester. And that goes for you too, Matthew, up there. Yeah, we'd like to keep both of you if we could, but we're thankful for the time that you're giving us. Well, you notice that uh, as we preach and as we sing up here, we're not wearing our masks like you are, but I've got mine, just in case. I've got it right here in the cuff. It makes me feel like my mother-in-law. She always had a tissue under the cuff of her blouse just in case she needed it. So I've got my face covering just in case I should need it. Y'all are going to have to pray for me. I, um, I, my, my com printer went on the blink, and I could not print my sermon, so I had to hastily type it into my, my cell phone. So this is a new, new one for me preaching from my cell phone. I hope I can see it, so give me a little extra grace as I, I do that and try out something new. But our scripture reference for today, if you'd like to open your Bible and turn to it, no pew Bibles, but you might have your phone or a Bible with you, and be reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 5, beginning with verse 2 and through the first part of verse 9. Let us hear the word of God. Now there is in Jerusalem near the sheep gate a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, Do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I am trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, Get up. Pick up your mat and walk. At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Can you picture it? This lovely pool of water surrounded by not one colonnade, but five colonnades and covered a beautiful place and gathered there around this pool a mass of people people of all kinds from all walks of life 
anxiously waiting for the slightest movement or stirring of the water, hoping against hope that this is their day for a miracle. This is their day for the beginning of a new life. That's what Jesus saw when he walked into and among this crowd of sick and hurting people. This gospel lesson, in a sense, is a, well, it's a picture for us of the unredeemed world around us. Masses of people with needs of all kinds. People who have unmet emotional, physical, mental, financial, relational or spiritual needs and infirmities. Like the people described in this passage, many of these people may not even know what's wrong with them, but deep down they know that something is not right. And they are yearning to be whole, yearning to be free, yearning to be sick no more free from their pain or illness. The sad thing is, many of these people today in this similar situation, they don't even know they're sick. Or they know they're sick, but they're looking for help in all the wrong places. Everywhere but where help can be found, which is in Jesus. And Jesus stands right there in front of them. As he stood in front of this man, and his arms are outstretched, he's saying, let me help you. Let me make you whole. Offering to do for this man and for anyone who has this need what they cannot do by themselves or for themselves. And at the root of many of the diseases and problems that we face in our society today, is what I call the me first sickness. And it seems to be spreading almost like a plague amongst us. What do I mean by a me first mentality? It's a selfish, self-centered, even narcissistic way of thinking and living. It's all about me and what I want, and meeting my needs, and expressing myself without regard to how that might affect our brother or our sister or our neighbor. We've all experienced how children are. You know, you look at a newborn baby and all you can think of is innocence, right? Children are born innocent, right? Wrong. <laughs> Wrong in a sense. I mean, yeah, yeah, they, they come out of the womb innocent. They, they haven't sinned. But from the very first moment, it's all about me, 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 me. What I want, what I need, give it to me now. You know that if you've been a parent. I mean, they'll keep you up a whole night long with me, 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 I want this or whatever. They don't think a moment about you not getting a wink of sleep. <laughs> Yes, it seems like, I don't know, that we're just born with this me-first, self-centered way of living. Unless you mistake what I'm saying, children are not the only ones who act selfishly. No matter how old we get, we all have that human tendency and impulse. It's part of our sinful, fallen nature, and even if we've experienced a new birth in Christ and are new creatures, there's that part of us, yeah, that old self that is never completely eradicated from us, not until the day that we pass from this life to the life of the world to come. It will remain with us, and we must always fight it and beat it back, right? With through, not through our own strength, but through the power of the Holy Spirit and God's Word. And we must grow and learn as you hope children do as they learn it's not all about me and the world does not revolve around me and me only but there are other people that I must take into consideration around me and I must think about what are my actions doing 
to affect my brother or sister or mother or father or friend or neighbor. And to think about that carefully and to sometimes say, I'll deny myself for the sake of the other. You see, when the sinful, fallen nature of us has its way and calls the shots, we, we clamor to be the first in the water without regard to our brother or sister or the person next to us whose needs and illness or problems may be much worse than ours, but do we care? No, this is my day. I've waited so long for my miracle and I see the water stirred. I'm going to be first. Me first. Get in the water. And this man says, I couldn't even move. I, I was hoping there would be someone that would be unselfish enough to say, hey, brother, you've been here 38 years. I've only been here 28. Let me help you in the water, and I'll wait later for my miracle. Can I help you? No, 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 no. And so he'd been there 38 years because he couldn't move. And I guess he didn't want to just lay right beside the pool so when he saw it, he could roll over in it, you know. <laughs> Maybe he wasn't too comfortable there. And he couldn't get in the water. And he tells Jesus that I have no one to put me in the water. And he didn't realize that the answer to his problem is not the water, it's not the angel that they thought was coming down from heaven to stir the waters. The answer to his problem was right before him. It was Jesus. They didn't rec he didn't recognize who it was that was standing right in front of him. And many people today... They don't understand who's standing right in front of them, who wants to help them, who has the answers to their need. They're looking everywhere else. Oh, some miracle thing they see on television. If you just take this pill or this thing, you know, you'll be well, you'll be fine. They look to their friends, they look to gurus, they look to self-help books, they look everywhere. But they won't humble themselves and say, Jesus, it's you I need, help me, because I'm not well. And only you can make me whole. What if we were in that man's sandals? Yes, the man who'd been there 38 years. Would we have been praying for the person next to us? Would we have been hoping that he or she might be the first one in the water? Well, you said, I, I can't walk, but I, I, I'll, I'll help and I'll pray for you and I'll do the best I can to help you get in the water. Would we, would we have done that or would, would we have been the one to clamor or to crawl over or to push someone out of our way to be first in the water? How many of us would we willingly and gladly give our place to another? Or would we embarrass ourselves by how vigorously we fought our way to be first? You only have to think about the uh, Christmas shopping season to have an answer to that for a lot of people in terms of what they would do. You only have to think about the people, the masses of people stacked and crowded to the front of entrances of stores, trying to be the first one in to get that, oh, that what, price buster special on that flat screen TV or that, that scarce and popular toy for their child or grandchild. Have you ever watched them as they trample one another, as they come to fisticuffs and they fight over that thing? Me first, me first, me first. That's what the unredeemed human heart is, but it can be a different story when our hearts are changed and redeemed by the grace of God when we have what the Bible calls the mind of Christ and a better word may be the attitude of Christ. The attitude of Christ? Well, what was the attitude of Christ? And aren't we supposed to have that attitude as we go through our lives? It was not a me first attitude. It was a you first. 
It was a you take my place attitude. I can wait. My time will come. My time's in God's hands. So we find in Philippians chapter 2, imitating Christ's humility or imitating Christ's attitude here. Listen to these words if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ if any comfort from his love if any fellowship with the spirit the holy spirit if any tenderness and compassion then make my joy complete by being like-minded having the same love being one in spirit and purpose and here's the kicker do nothing this is always gets me i mean he doesn't say try for the most part to he says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others, what, better than yourself. Each of you should look not only to your own interest, but also to the interest of others. Think about others. Consider others' needs around you. And then he gives this example, a beautiful hymn that's found here in the book of Philippians, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. And the Bible says we have the mind of Christ in another place. We have the attitude of Christ. The question will, will we express and live out that attitude that we already have? It's in us. Will we let it manifest ourselves? It's because Jesus was being, it was in the very nature of God, but did not consider equality with God something to be exploited. Oh, he could have exploited it. He didn't. He wouldn't even change a loaf, I mean, a, a stone into a loaf of bread and exploit his powers to lift himself in a level above the human race. No, no, I will understand and know hunger so I can understand what it's like for others in the world to feel hunger and to do without. No, he didn't exploit his godness, he made himself nothing taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even the death of the cross, which was about the worst kind of death anyone could imagine, and still is the worst kind of way to die, probably, that has ever been devised or ever will be devised. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and earth, and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Can any of us, without Christ being in us and being Lord of our lives, can any of us, without the power of the Holy Spirit, ever come to a place where we can consider others as more important than ourselves? Now that takes a mighty work of God to overcome that kind of me-first attitude. I know I need it in my life. And without it, I can be the most selfish, self-centered person in the world. And every one of us can be if we just yield to what we want and our lower, unredeemed human nature. How many of us are willing to be patient, to wait for another time and give our place to another for their time? How many of us instead are impatient, wanting to force things and make them happen on our terms when we want according to our plan rather than saying, God, I trust you with yours. I trust your good plans. I'll give my place to another. I'll consider others more important than myself. I'll consider the needs and interests of others around me. I will not live a self-centered life because it is contrary to the very nature and person of my Lord Jesus Christ. I read recently about a, well, he was a Welsh miner named Thomas Sampson. He worked in the mines, in the deepest, darkest crannies of those mines in Wales. 
It was a dangerous place to work. Many people lost their lives working there. But that's how he eked out a meager living. But he was a hard worker. He was an honest man. He was doing his best to provide for his family. And one day, his foreman noticed his hard work and all that, and he said, Thomas, I've got a job for you above ground. <laughs> How many of you ever prayed, Lord, give me a job above ground? <laughs> Enough time in the mines. Well, that time came, and he said, it'll be easier work, fewer hours, higher pay, and it's not nearly as dangerous, not really dangerous at all. Would you be interested? And Thomas said, whoa, would I be interested? Yes, very interested. Uh, but, but there's this guy I, I met. His name is Tregony. You know, Tregony works with me down there in that darkness, and he's, he's not very strong. He's not as strong as I. He's got a weak constitution, and he's got a family to provide for. I'm worried that his life will be cut short working down there. Would you consider giving the job to Tregony instead? And the foreman was moved by Thomas's generosity, and he said, yes. And he did. And Thomas continued to work in the darkness of those mines for a time until the foreman once came to him again and said, there's another opening above ground. Would you like it? This time, Thomas accepted the offer. And Thomas and Tregony both worked above ground in that mining enterprise for over two decades together and became close friends. Me first or you first? May Jesus help us all from the least of us to the greatest to move from a me first mentality to a no you go ahead you first mentality may we grow up as children and mature in Christ to have that kind of attitude you know that was the attitude that we read about Jesus had when he hung on that cross he was saying you first he put us first He denied himself his life, his comforts, his freedom from pain, and so much that we cannot even fathom. He denied himself for you and me. That's how he lived. That's how God calls us to live. This happened in a place called Bethesda. I've been blessed to go there and see where that pool once was. It was not the beauty of all the colonnades because all that's been destroyed, but I could be at the very place they believed that Jesus was and this man was when he was healed. When he got up, picked up his mat, and walked. That word Bethesda has at its root the word that means to send. And we have to believe that there's somehow meaning to that because we believe that God sent Jesus to that man in his need to make him well. And we believe that after he was made well and whole by the grace of power of God that he was sent to be a witness. In fact, if you read the rest of the story, he was a witness to people that weren't really ready to hear his story because Jesus had healed them on the Sabbath and that was a sacred cow of theirs, you know. But, but he was a witness nonetheless because they saw that the man who'd been there 38 years was now healed and they said, who did this to you, for you? Who could have done that? And they were amazed and yet angry because it happened on a Sabbath. But he was a witness. He was sent. And the truth is that God is sending all of us. We are, yeah, not 
apostles with capital A's, maybe, like the 12 and others, but little apostles, ones who are sent. And we are sent and we have a witness because hopefully we have been touched also by the grace of God through Jesus Christ and he has called us to stand up, to take up our mat and walk and be free from our infirmities or have the grace to endure them for a time, free to consider our brother and sister and our neighbor. If we could do that more and more, I think some of the unrest and the disharmony and the trouble that we see inflicting our world, I think it would make a difference. I think it would if we all considered others before ourselves. So what will it be for us? Me first or you first? You decide. I think we know what God wants for us. And if we'll choose the me first, if we'll choose the mind of Christ, we'll find that we have more joy. Now hear this, it's not mine and it's trite, I understand this, but it's important. We'll have joy, which stands for J, Jesus first, O, others second, and Y, yourself last. If we could just do that, we'd have more joy, more peace, more love in our world. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and God's people say, Amen. go before I know that you've even gone to win my war. You came back the head of my enemy. You come back and you call it my victory.
And now as I take my leave as pastor of Bethel United Methodist Church, I wish you all the best. I wish you God's best. I wish you Jesus. I wish you the attitude, the mind of Christ himself and the blessings of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.